morning, a day. Welcome to Western Hills Baptist Church. Today we're going to be in the book of Mark, chapter 5. And last week, Jesus had taught his first parable, the parable of the sower and the seed, as well the miracle of the calming of the sea. And this week, as we get into Mark 5, Jesus and his disciples are in Gardenerinus, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. With that, verse 1 reads, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gardenerus. So here Jesus is in the, and his disciples. They've arrived on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And recall in chapter 4 that this is the same sea that they were afraid of sinking and to which Jesus calmed the storm. And when he had come out of the boat, he immediately met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Here we see that word again that we often see in the book of Mark immediately. So what's, what's these tombs? Well, the tombs are, place, are a place of the dead. And tombs are, are carved out of the, the rock of the hills. So you have to th be thinking about this. What, what's going on here? These guys had just crossed the sea that gave them trouble the last time they crossed. And so here they are crossing the sea. It's calm. And they probably think they, the coast is clear when all of a sudden comes a man with an unclean spirit. And it says here, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. So this guy that's running around the tombs, he, he is the fear of the community. No one can bind him, even with chains. This, this guy is unhinged, a man out of control, a man with such strength that chains could not even hold him. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces, neither could anyone tame him. No one could tame this guy who lived in the tombs. Why is that? Well, because he had superhuman, supernatural strength. Uh, his power was, un was released by these unclean spirits. And of course, no man, no human can bind Satan without the help of Jesus Christ. The good news is we have power over Satan, as long as the power is given in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, there are not evil spirits behind every bush waiting for us, but rest assured there are evil spirits out there. Um, I'm sure I have, and you probably have come across some evil people uh, in your lives, but I'm not sure I've ever come across a, a, possessed, a, a person possessed by demon to the point where they've lost all control. And I'm kind of glad I haven't, because I'm sure that wouldn't be a pretty sight. But the point here is that you need to have Jesus uh, in your faith to, to bind an evil spirit. So let's, let's look at the next couple of verses and see how Jesus deals with this demon-possessed man. Verse 5. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. day and night continually. This man, he was a terror and torment to both himself and those around him. It's been said that the devil is a cruel master to those that are led captive by him. And this wretched man was day and night cry crying and running through the mountains and tombs, cutting himself with stones as he ran barefoot uh, upon them. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. This man with the evil spirit, he spotted Jesus a long way off. Well, the evil spirit knew exactly who Jesus was. So here you have this wild man that no one can control running towards Jesus. And the man, the verse says here, worshipped him. It says worshipped him, but this would be uh, better rendered, with, uh, fell on his knees in front of him. This is an act of homage rather than one of worship. 
In other words, the demon shows respect because he recognizes that he is confronted with one greatly superior to him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Now, it, it seems here to me, um, with these two verses, that verse 7 is actually in response to verse 8. Um, Jesus commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man, and the unclean spirit didn't have any choice in the matter. The demon addresses Jesus by shouting at the top of his, of his voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Of course, the, uh, the demon recognized that he was in the presence of the one who threatened his very existence. In addressing Jesus, the demon, he, he uses his personal name. And the fact that the demon uses the title Son of the Most High God, it's a title that implies the demon recognized the deity of Jesus Christ. But the fact the demon used the title was not to express his belief in the dignity of Jesus, but in, in the hope of controlling him. We sort of saw this back in chapter 1, if you recall, verse 24, where the demon said, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? The demon says, do not torment me, do not torment me. The, the evil spirit within the man knows that Jesus has the power to put them away for good. And they're, they're, playing, and they're pleading with Jesus not to destroy them. Verse 9. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion. For we are many. Legion. Well, I'm not entirely sure why the Spirit said his name is Legion. Uh, uh, a Roman legion at the time, uh, in Jesus' time, was about 6,000 troops. Perhaps the man had 6,000 demons. We don't know. But what does come to mind is that number 6,000. Anytime I see numbers, I, it grabs my attention. We are fast approaching the end of the world age when the Antichrist appears and after the millennium where we reign with Christ for a thousand years. And during the millennium, we know that all demons are chained in the abyss waiting for judgment. It's a time of torment for them. We are about 6,000 years now from the time when Adam walked on the earth. So could this demon know that his time was coming up and he would be in torment as spoken of earlier? We don't know. Verse 10. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. <clears throat> so this evil spirit, speaking through the man, requesting not to be sent out of the area. In Luke 8.31, the request is that they not be sent into the abyss, which was a place of confinement before judgment. As we just talked about, this would be this would be torment for them. The demon doesn't want to be taken there. He doesn't want to go back there. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. It's not unusual to have a presence of uh, of a large herd of swine in this region. This is the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, which was largely a Gentile area. And swine, naturally, are a big animal. They're an unclean animal. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. So here is Jesus confronting these evil spirits with all the people standing around and watching this event play out. And these spirits, they're begging Jesus to send them into the swine and not back to the abyss. Now these spirits, they're not particular. They're not particular. They will enter anything. They are bent on destroying. They are emissaries of Satan, who is the master destroyer. 
I just want to take a second or, or a minute here and talk about the teaching of reincarnation for a second. Reincarnation, this, this teaching is becoming more and more common today. And in that teaching is that spirits understand where your spirit has been in the past. Well, this is nothing more than devil worship. We're talking about evil spirit possession. People that hold to this teaching or teach this are blind to the fact about evil spirits. They overlook the fact that evil spirits are supernatural and they can exist or indwell in one person in one generation and possess another person century later. Evil spirits are, are not in the same form of flesh that you and I are. We, we have flesh bodies. There was a lady that claimed that she had lived some 400 years ago in Spain, and she described the street and the number of the house she lived on way back then, and she described the surroundings. Yet, this woman had never been to Spain, but she gave details that only a person living then would know. So was her spirit there? No, absolutely not. The woman living today was possessed by the same evil spirit that a lady which lived there 400 years prior to was possessed with. Though the information will be correct, it wasn't the person in the flesh giving the information, but the evil spirit or the demonic within her that was revealing the facts. These demons want to inhabit a body. They don't care. They're not particular. And so the request of these evil spirits is that they may be sent into the swine. They don't care what kind of body they inhabit. Verse 13. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out, entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned into the sea. So here's the question. Why did Jesus give them permission to enter the swine? an act that uh, ultimately resulted in the destruction of the entire herd. Well, it could be that Jesus wanted to give tangible evidence to the man and to the people that the demons had actually left him and, and that their purpose had been to destroy him, even as they destroyed the pigs. So those who fed the swine fled. They told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Those that fed the swine fed, talking about the pig farmers, the, the ones that fed the pigs, those, that, those are the ones that witnessed the demons coming out of the man and entering the swine. So what happened here? In effect, these guys... These herders, they, they lost their jobs. They, they just witnessed something frightening to them. So they went out to the city and spread the word. What about happened to the man with the pigs? But here's the deal in all of this. These guys didn't care about the demonic man running around the tombs. They didn't care one bit. They didn't care about the evil spirits, where they lived or what they did. They didn't care until it affected their personal lives and their income. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. So think about this here. The farmers, pig farmers, they came to Jesus and saw the one who was demon-possessed. What's his condition now? Well, the guy's clothed in his right mind. He's no longer running around the tombs as a naked wild man that can't be controlled. Why were they afraid? Why would they be afraid of a miracle such as this? Well, they lost their pork. They lost the pigs. In a sense, they lost their jobs. This hurt their pocketbooks. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. So these pork farmers, they saw the whole thing play out right before, right before their eyes. They saw the evil spirits argue with Jesus and Jesus commanding them to enter into the pigs. They saw the pigs run as fast as they could into the sea 
and drown themselves. All they could think of as they witnessed these pigs running the sea and drowning was the great financial loss, the impact to their wallet. When Jesus was around, things happened. And of course, they, they didn't want anything else unexpected to happen to them. They were concerned. All about the bottom line. All about money. Verse 17. Then they pled to then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Here they are. They're they're pleading with Jesus to leave. Why? Well, they just saw, they recognized a mighty force at work in Jesus that they couldn't understand, something they couldn't control. As well, they just lost an entire herd of pigs. So they're worried what could possibly happen next with even potentially more serious consequences. These guys, these folks, they were selfish. They were selfish here because they had they had encountered material loss. The loss of their income dominated their minds and their hearts rather than compassion for their former demonic. They asked Jesus to leave. Well, guess what? Jesus is not going to stay around where he's not wanted. Verse 18. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Of course, the, the man that was possessed with the evil spirits now clean wanted to go with Jesus and his disciples. He wanted to get in the boat. You can't blame him. He's grateful. He's healed. He's made whole. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion on you. Jesus wouldn't let him go with him. The Lord, the Lord's going to use this person. This person that lived amongst the dead, possessed and is now clean. He's going to use him to be a witness to his family and those of the community. Those that knew how he, how he was will see the change that came over him. And so Jesus is using this man to spread, to spread the word of God and to plant seed into the community. Jesus is using the one least expected to be his witness amongst the community. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Everywhere this man went, he told the people about Jesus and what Jesus did for him. And it says there, they all marveled. They all marveled. They, the people were open. They were open to what this former, former demonic had to say. They knew the strength he had to break the chains and the way he lived. And now standing before them was this clean-cut man, sound mind, preaching the word to them. And all the people that listened to him, they marveled at what they were seeing and what they were hearing. The man that everyone feared was now telling them about the love of the Lord. Verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. And he was by the sea. So we see the, the scene shifting a little bit here. Jesus has returned to the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And if you recall from last message, uh, Mark 4, that while on the east side, where the demons were cast out of the man into the swine and the swine drowned themselves, uh, Jesus was asked to leave. They were afraid of Jesus and what other miracles he might perform that would cost them their livelihood. So now Jesus and the disciples cross back over and they're near the area of Capernaum. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came. And Jairus was his name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Jesus probably busy teaching here when he was interrupted by the plea of one of the synagogue rulers. 
that be injurious. And we can see the faith in this ruler. Now, he came to Jesus, fell at Jesus' feet. Jairus heard and believed what Jesus was saying. He knew that Jesus possessed the power of God within him. And he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. Jairus says, Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed. Do you think there was any doubt in the mind of Jairus? No, this ruler said that she may be healed, and she will live. This is great faith. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. In other words, you know, Mark really, he records no oral reply by Jesus to Jairus' request. Jesus does not speak here. He simply acts. So he sent out with Jairus to go to the child, and a large crowd, crowd followed him. These were probably curiosity seekers. Now a woman... Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. So here the story, uh, the healing of the woman with a hemorrhage of blood. And this, this story here is sort of sandwiched in between the report of Jairus' daughter illness and Jesus' action in raising her. Now, what's interesting, I see this number 12, and anytime I see numbers in scriptures, I pay attention. 12. 12 denotes governmental perfection. We see that with the 12 sons of, of Jacob, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles. Well, this woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. And it goes on to say, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, was no better, but grew worse. This woman, she'd been treated by many doctors and she spent all the money she had. Instead of getting better, her condition had gotten worse. It seems the more money she spent, the worse off she got. No doctor had an answer to this woman's ailment. The doctors gave up on this, this sick woman and their treatment of her. But when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. This woman came behind Jesus in the crowd, touched his garment. This was probably done to avoid being noticed. Obviously, she was, she had some illness and probably was uh, considered unclean. So she kind of snuck in there, touched his garment. And this was an act of faith on her part. She was full of confidence that Jesus was able to heal. But she trembled because she knew she was unworthy, as we just mentioned here. She was unclean. We sort of see her humility and the confidence of a sinner coming to Jesus for healing. Verse 28. For she said, if I may only touch his clothes, I shall be made well. She knew that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. Don't you see the faith that this woman had here? She didn't sit back and say, this is a waste of time. It's too much work for me to fight the crowds to do it. No, she struggled. She fought the crowd. She got close enough to teach the hem, to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Question for you and me is, how much do we reach out seeking Jesus for healing? And it says in verse 29, immediately, immediately that fountain of blood of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, that issue of blood was dried up. She was healed. She felt it in her body. That term felt in the Greek is uh, gnosko, meaning to, to know absolutely. This woman knew by divine power that she was healed immediately of her blood issue. In verse 30, Jesus says, And immediately he knew, Jesus knew, knowing in himself that the power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? 
Jesus says, who touched my clothes? Of course, of course Jesus knew who touched his clothes. Now, you have to think about this. His, his disciples are probably a bit confused. Um, why did Jesus say this? As you know, it's evidenced in the next verse, verse 31. But the disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched my clothes? Well, of course, the, the crowds are pressing all around Jesus and the disciples, and the di disciples are questioning Jesus. They say, Look at all the people. You have to keep in mind that Jesus' disciples, they're no doubt tired from the journey. And all they're trying to do is get to Jairus' house, whose daughter's ill. Disciples, they're, they're working to keep the crowds back from, away from Jesus. And the entire idea that the, that the question that Jesus asked, who touched me, it seemed foolish to the disciples. I mean, they're wondering, why would Jesus ask such a question? Well, Jesus said this so that the woman might make herself known and confess the whole matter so that the power of her faith and the, the greatness of the miracle would be manifested and bring praises to God. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. Yeah, so Jesus is looking around. Of course, Jesus knew who it was. Jesus, Jesus' purpose here was to make personal contact with this woman. She needed to know that it was her faith, not her superstitious belief, but it was her faith that had caused God to heal her. Verse 33. But the woman, fearing and trembling, no, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Of course, this woman knew what happened to her. We just read that. She knew she was healed. Though trembling with fear, she came forward and prostrated herself before Jesus and told him the whole truth. Now, this had to take great courage because she was regarded as ceremonially unclean. But this woman had the faith to know that Jesus could heal her. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Jesus said, he calls her daughter. This is the only occurrence uh, in the Gospels of Jesus addressing a woman by, by that word daughter. The word daughter, as used, is, is one of kindness. It's, and Jesus was inspiring confidence and dissipating any fear she may have had. Jesus made it clear that it was her faith in Jesus and God that had healed her. And that word healed here in the Greek is sozo, meaning to make whole, to make whole, to preserve, to save. And I like that. This woman's faith saved her. While Jesus was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So here comes the family out to meet Jesus and the ruler of the synagogue talking about Jairus. They bring to, to them the news of the death of his daughter. And of course, since death is final, they advise Jairus not to bother Jesus any longer. What does Jesus do? Verse 36 says, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Jesus turns to Jairus and says, Don't be afraid, just believe. This word of assurance must have been just what Jairus needed, because Jairus in no way tried to dissuade Jesus from resuming his journey to the child's bedside. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and, the, and John, the brother of James. At this time, Jesus decided to separate himself from the crowd that was following him. And an, an incredibly huge miracle was about to take place, and he would only have a chosen few witness it. Peter, James, and John, they, 
they had a particularly close relationship to Jesus and no doubt why he selected them to, to be a witness of this miracle. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. So here's Jesus. He arrives at Jairus' house and he sees this great commotion taking place. It says here, those that wept and wailed loudly. Now, this is talking about hired professionals. This was common practice in those days. Hired professionals who weep and carry on for the death of a loved one. They were all going through their routine for the dead when Jesus arrived. It's ironic that Jesus had just dismissed one large crowd, only to find the, the house occupied by another large crowd. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. So upon entering the house, Jesus asked them, well, Why are you making such a commotion here? This child is not dead, she's sleeping. And what happened? Verse 4, he says, And they ridiculed him. But when he put them all outside, he took the father and the, and the mother child, and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. When Jesus told the people that their little girl was dead, uh, that she was only sleeping, they all laughed and scorned at Jesus for what he had said. Then Jesus chased all the, the spiritual dead weight. Well, I like to call them spiritual dead weight. He chased them all out of the room, talking about those unbelievers and the unbelievers of the power of God. Jesus took only the family members with faith and the three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Verse 41. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus stood by the side of the child, took her hand and spoke the Aramaic words, Talitha kum, which Mark conveniently translates in this verse, little girl, I say to you, get up, arise. Mark translated this verse for the Gentile reader since this was an area that was uh, surrounded by Gentile population. Verse 42 says, Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. The girl arose. She not only arose, but she walked. Here again, I like this number, 12. The age, this age of this girl is 12 years old. One year for each of the tribes. Overcome with great amazement. What was the response of the five witnesses to the miracle? They were overcome. Verse 43. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. Notice that Jesus gave two orders here. Two orders to the witnesses. First off, they were not to reveal the facts of the miracle. Well, I doubt that would have been possible because there was too many people that had known of the death of the girl and not likely that her parents could go and hide her. Jesus most likely implied that he wanted to keep the miracle as private as possible to avoid unnecessary publicity. Second order Jesus gave was to feed the girl, give her something to eat. Jesus took care that something should be given her to eat. This would confirm that she was both raised to life and in a good state of health, but she also had an appetite. What comes to mind here is that when Jesus gives us a spiritual rebirth or new life, he provides to us spiritual food. And of course, that is found in his word. You know, and in that, the good news is that we will never be found wanting, we'll never be hungry. Amen and amen.